Access to water and sanitation are recognised by the United Nations as human rights, reflecting the fundamental nature of these basic needs in every person's life. Lack of access to safe, sufficient and affordable water sanitation and hygiene facilities has a devastating effect on the health, dignity and prosperity of billions of people and has significant consequences for the realisation of other human rights and for social and economic development. This is an introduction to the human rights to safe drinking water and, and sanitation and we're going to focus specifically on the human right to water. Human rights are powerful ideas, but they're also guaranteed in binding international human rights law. They're part of the human rights to an adequate standard of living, which is guaranteed in Article 11 of the International Covenant on Econo Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. In Article 27 of the Convention on the Rights of the Child and in Article 28 of the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities and in the Convention of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, the rights to water and sanitation are also guaranteed. These treaties have been in force for many years. However, it took until 2010 for countries to recognise through a resolution that the human rights to water and sanitation are indeed part of or derived from the human right to an adequate standard of living. And this has been followed by subsequent resolutions, one in 2015 saying there are separate rights to water and sanitation. The rights are also guaranteed at regional levels where there have been covenants and charters such as the Africa Charter on Human and People's Rights Resolution 300 on the right to water in 2015. When a country signs up to an international human rights treaty, it agrees to comply with that, what that treaty says and human rights treaties so guarantee human rights. So by signing a human rights treaty, a country agrees to guaranteeing these rights in its jurisdiction. The country has decided to sign the treaty and is therefore obliged to realise these rights at the national level. And the way it can be enacted is through laws, but also in the executive through regulations, policies, plans and strategies. Remember, human rights are for humans, not only for citizens. So they need to be guaranteed and realised for non-citizens as well. The obligations of the state is to respect, protect and fulfil all of the human rights, including those guaranteed in the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. The obligation to respect means that states may not prevent people from enjoying their human rights to water and sanitation, for example, by selling land with a water source on it that's used by the local population without providing an adequate alternative. The obligation to protect means that states must prevent others from interfering with people's enjoyment of the human rights to water and sanitation. This can be done by introducing and enforcing rules, for example, to prohibit cutting off water supply for users who are unable to pay. The obligation to fulfil requires states to ensure that the conditions are in place for everyone to enjoy the human rights to water and sanitation. This doesn't mean that the state has to provide services directly. For example, a mechanism to fulfil the human right to sanitation may be to require that all buildings must have sanitation facilities that meet certain standards. Direct assistance by the state may be required for some individuals or groups who cannot access their human rights through other mechanisms. So the human rights to water and sanitation have specific standards which serve to assess whether those services meet human rights requirements. These are very similar to those found in technical guidance on wash services and, for example, the joint monitoring programme um, indicators for the S Sustainable Development Goal 6. Unfortunately, ultimately, the human rights standards describe what a good service looks like. The standards which you can see here, availability, physical accessibility, affordability and safety or quality and acceptability are then broken down into more detail, which help to define how to claim your rights. But they're still general enough to be interpreted in ways that are context specific. For example, the accessibility standard requires design to ensure access and use by persons with disabilities. On affordability, while human rights law does not require services to be provided free of charge, states are obliged to provide free services or put adequate subsidy mechanisms in place to ensure that services are affordable for the poor. 
The human rights principles, which you can see on this slide, equality and non-discrimination, showing that everyone is equal before the law and with a focus on people who are being left behind. Participation and inclusion means every person is entitled to active, free and meaningful participation in and contribution to decision making processes affecting them. Accountability which means that state and other duty bearers should be accountable for the fulfillment of their obligations and sustainability, meaning that all states must take appropriate measures towards the full realization of rights to water and sanitation and avoid slippage and retrogression or going backwards. These principles undermine not uh, underpin, sorry, not only the human rights to water and sanitation, but all human rights. They serve to identify and address systemic challenges in the realization of human rights to all for all. So what's progressive realisation? Progressive realisation means that states must move as quickly and effectively as possible towards getting good water and sanitation services for all using maximum available resources. The concept of progressive realisation accepts that services for all is a step by step process that takes time, especially for countries that are starting from a very low base, and it faces many technical, economic and political constraints. So that therefore that has to, it can take time to go from the political and legal commitment to the actual realisation of the rights in practice. However, it's not an excuse for not taking action. It requires steadily increasing the number of people with access and with a view to getting universal access as fast as possible. Any slip back or retrogression in human rights terms is not allowed, so it's important to make sure the services already in place can be sustained and to prioritise ensuring access to a minimum level of service to comply with human rights. This often means taking specific measures to assist marginalised and disadvantaged individuals and groups.